number 801. Grab a hymnal, if you will. 801, How Great Thou Art, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder. Stand with me if you're able. We'll sing a couple verses, and then we'll pass it over to uh, the evangelists and the family. 801. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe is played, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. My soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the tree. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and Sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou. Verse number four. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Brother Merle, will you open the service in prayer tonight? Amen. You may be seated while they're coming. I just want to mention we are here uh, Monday through Friday or Sunday through Friday, but it's already Monday. And uh, each evening at six o'clock on Wednesday and Friday, we're going to have finger foods after. So if you're planning on coming on one of those days, uh, do be prepared to, to fellowship and have some finger foods, foods as well. Um, uh, the offering, everything that comes in the offering tonight will be going to the evangelist and, and the family. So uh, do uh, keep that in mind as well. My family's coming at this time, and we're going to be singing a song entitled Little Things. Good. Aren't you glad that you don't have to have a whole long list of reasons why God can use you? Have to have a whole long list of accolades and talents. If you just bring the little that you have, and you're willing to give it to the Lord, he can take it, and he can do great things through it. But just like he did with the little boy's lunch and in many other places in the Word of God. So we're going to sing tonight about little things. And how Good. Were blessed 
Good evening. It is so good to see you here tonight. Welcome to Monday Night of Revival Meetings here at LaGrange, and we are so thankful that you've chosen to come and to be a part of what God wants to do. I believe God wants to speak to each and every one of us tonight, and if we'll be willing to listen, we'll be willing to say yes to the Spirit, I believe that we'll leave this place changed, and we'll leave this place closer to our Lord. But we're going to sing tonight about His power, sing about who He is tonight, so we're going to turn to hymn number 32 for our next song tonight. Hymn number 32. We're going to sing three in a row here, so I'll let you stay seated for the first two, and then we'll stand up for the last one. How about that? All right. As long as you sing out. Okay. If you're not singing out, I'm just going to make you stand mid song. It's going to be, it's going to be rough. All right. So sing it out. I sing the mighty power of God. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the There's not a plant or flower below, but makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care. And everywhere that man can be thou. singing to start our service. Let's go back a few pages. Page number 29. Hymn number 29. This is my father's world. He's in charge. Everything that goes on has to go through him. Aren't you grateful for that tonight? Let's sing it out. Hymn number 29. This is my father's world. This is my father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings and rounds. is my father's world the birds their carols 
This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems of so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus, who shall be satisfied and earth and hand be one. Wonderful. You're singing so well tonight. Turn now to 885, all the way to the back of your hymnal tonight. And I want us to sing this as a prayer to God. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. That's why we're here tonight. We want the Spirit to be filling us and be controlling us. Will you stand with me as we sing? A song of prayer to our Lord, Spirit, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me. Fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Let's sing that once more. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Thank you for your singing tonight. You may be seated. Pastor and his family are coming at this time. They have a special for us. And then Brother Smith will bring the word of God tonight. When compared to God, God has led me 
your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 63, would you? Isaiah chapter 63 in the scripture. Such a blessing to see you out tonight. I'm so thankful for that as you're turning. I want to mention a few things that are available on the back table that I think will be a help and a blessing to you. Uh, there are some books back there, several different books. This is called Beyond a Shadow of a Doubt, about assurance of salvation, how you can know you know that you know that you're going to heaven. This is a great, great tool along those lines. And it's a look at biblical assurance by a pastor up in Connecticut. He's been there for many, many years, a faithful servant and a faithful man of God. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, ladies, for that special. That was a blessing. And uh, so that's back there. I also want to mention that there are some gospel tracts. This is a story of a friend of mine who's a pastor in, in South Dakota. He was saved out of the Amish, and he grew up in the northeast part of Missouri. And uh, God did an amazing work, really an amazing work. And uh, there's, there were five different families that were reached out of the Amish by just this really supernatural hand of Almighty God. And, um, and so I, I want to encourage you to grab these. If, if they're just loose leaf, they're free, just grab them. If you'd like to buy a pack, you can buy a pack of 100 for just a small price. And uh, that's a great way to get gospel tracts out, a great way to get testimony tracts out. Uh, let me just pause right there and say that, um, that uh, there's been an effort of Bible-believing Baptist folks just like this church and folks just like these folks that uh, have been trying to get the gospel out over the last year. It's called Fill America, and a group of preachers up in Michigan started it, a couple of them, one up in the northern part of the Upper Peninsula and then one up in the main part. And uh, they said, you know, let's try to get our people motivated to give gospel tracts. How many of you believe you ought to give the gospel out? Let me see your hands. You believe that? And, uh, you know, this is a great way to start. This is just not the only way, but it's a great way to get start. And if a Christian won't give out a gospel tract, you know, I don't have a whole lot of respect for that. And, uh, but if you'll give out a gospel tract, God can use it. You say, well, I'm kind of afraid. I'm kind of timid. I don't know what to say. Well, just give it out and say, uh, Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. Uh, happy, Merry Christmas. Happy Valentine's Day. You can use every holiday that way. And that's a great way to start giving out gospel tracts. And uh, if, if it's not a holiday, sometimes I make up a holiday. Happy NASCAR Day. But anyway, there's all kinds of great ways to give out gospel tracts. Just give out gospel tracts. Every Christian ought to, just as, just as basic, this is basic Christian entry level 101 Christianity. Everybody can give out gospel tracts. And I'll tell you what I do. I always smile first. And I say howdy. And I try to warm their heart in that regard. And you know, a lot of times a smile breaks down barriers. Uh, people, there's not a lot of smiles. Am I the only one that's noticed there's not a whole lot of smiling going around these days? Well, you know, when you smile, then it, it kind of forces people to, to respond in one way or the other. And uh, they don't always smile back, but at least you know you're, they, they know you're friendly. And then I'll give out a gospel tract, and oftentimes I'll say, God bless you. And you wouldn't believe how many people receive it and with, receive it with great warmth. And uh, so that's great. And so I want to encourage you to get that. We print people's testimonies in track form. We have about 17 different tracks now that are in track form, testimonies that are in track form. And a great tool. That's a great tool. Also, back there, there are some thumb drives. This looks like a little business card, but it's preaching. There's about 100 different messages on here. If you were to buy these in CD form, it would be way more than if you bought just a thumb drive. And uh, so uh, this is back there. We use what comes in off the table to go to the mission field at least one time a year. Just this last November, we were able to go to Italy and preach the gospel. And uh, so that's back there. Then there's some things that my boys have made, some beautiful pens and uh, some other items that I think will be a help. And then this is free. How to encourage your pastor. Uh, pray for him and for his family consistently. Here's another one. Don't burden him down before a message with some heavy news or important information. Wait till after the message is over. <laughs> and even then, be careful how you approach it. Uh, don't listen to criticism about your pastor or his family. Here's, here's such a crucial one. Don't assume things and act upon your assumptions. You know, I think that assumption and accusation has been, they've been great twin tools by the devil to destroy churches. And if the devil can keep me from talking to you face to face and having a civil kind conversation and then whisper things in my ear about you and whisper things in your ear about me, boy, he can stir up a lot of trouble. So don't, uh, don't allow assumptions to rule you. Here's one, uh, uh, sit as close to the front as possible in church. <laughs> 
Uh, now, seriously, that's, I'm saying it tongue in cheek, but I am giving a little hint there. You know, it's funny how when we come to Walmart, we're looking for the closest one in Walmart. And the seats at a ball game are the most expensive seats, are the closest ones. And when we come to church, there's this great gulf fix between the pulpit and the first line of, of people. Uh, Brother Ed, so good to see you. Anyway, <laughs> here's one. Say amen, smile, or at least nod your head. In some way, communicate that you're not dead. You know, that's a real blessing. You know, the pastor has preached to a lot of dead people over the years, and it's a real grief of mine. So, yeah, amen. Get you a sign or something. We found it. We found it, Miss Mary. Miss Mary was wondering how she could say amen in church. There you go. Somebody needs to get that to her quick before she goes into cardiac arrest. Uh, I want to encourage you to go by the table, and, uh, and I hope that you'll work at, at getting visitors. Now, tonight's ladies' night, so ladies have been responsible to get visitors. So if you brought a visitor tonight, ladies, I'm going to ask you how many points you have. If they were here Sunday morning, we count them as 100 points. If they were not, they're 500 points. And if they're here for the first time tonight or the first time in a long time, we'll count them as 1,000 points. Okay? Tomorrow night is going to be men's night. That means all the men have the responsibility and privilege of getting folks to the service. So men, go after it. Don't let the ladies outdo you and outwork you and out invite you. Let's get after it and see what God can do. Uh, tomorrow night, Pastor, how many Sunday school classes are there in the church? Two. Okay. So we're going to have a Sunday school night tomorrow night. Okay. So, I mean, Wednesday night. So the Sunday school teacher is responsible to get their class here on Wednesday night. Okay. And we'll go by percentage on that night. Uh, we'll, we'll go by that percentage of, of the average attendance of the year so far. Okay. And uh, if you get a visitor, we'll count them as 10 percentage points extra, okay? And then we'll tell you more about Thursday and Friday night as the week progresses. Remember, this is just a tool to help folks get in church and get to church and be a part of this such an important thing. Ladies, if you brought a visitor or a guest tonight, let me see your hand. If you brought a visitor or a guest, any, any lady? All right. Let, there is? Yes? Yes. How many? Who did you bring? Oh, very good. Okay, very good, very good. Well, be sure and see me after the service, or have your wife, Sue, uh, see me after the service. Let's pray right now. Lord, Lord, speak to our hearts. Thank you for the privilege you've given to us to be in church. Thank you for a revival meeting and for a church that still believes in that. And I pray that you'd bless our service tonight. Speak to us, Lord. There's needs here that only you know and that only you can meet. And I pray that you would meet those needs supernaturally, Lord. I pray that you'd bind Satan far from this place, may have no influence no power, no authority whatsoever. And we'll thank you for what you do and how you work tonight because we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Some time ago, uh, my son Peter was uh, out down by the creek. We have a creek in back of our house. And uh, he was out by the creek with some of his friends. This was probably, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10 years ago now. And he came running like a tornado up from the creek and screaming. And he came to me and he held out his hand and he said, Dad, Dad, I just got bit by a snake. I said, what? Now, up here, I don't know if you have snakes that are poisonous. Are there poisonous snakes in Indiana? Okay, well, uh, there, there are definitely poisonous snakes down in North Carolina. And so I said, you did what? What, what happened? He said, well, we're down by the creek and, and, and somebody had a machete and, and they chopped the snake in half. And, and the, the, the one half that had a head, they said, somebody should pick it up. And I picked it up and I said, you did what? Well, what, what's the matter? You, you did what? Well, what's the matter with you? We went to the doctor. And the doctor heard the story from my son about the machete and cutting snakes in half and picking up snakes. And he just looked at me and I just kind of shrugged. <laughs> I, said, I said, I'm not raising my boys to be little girls, you know, I mean, really. But that's the question I asked him. I said, you, 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 you did what? He said, well, what'd you do that for? That's what I want to preach to you about tonight. You, you, you did what? You, 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 you did what? You did what? To the Holy Spirit? That's what I'd like to preach to you about tonight. Now, I want us to go to several passages. We're going to begin in the book of Jude, and then we're coming to Isaiah 63. So turn back, if you would, to your right, to the book of Jude. And we're coming to Jude and verse 19. I want us to see what the Bible says 
about what you can do to the Holy Spirit. Now, these are negatives, and with every negative has a positive. So, so I'm asking the question, you, you did what? You did what to the Holy Spirit? Let's look at the book of Jude and see what the Bible says. Jude starts by Jude saying, I, I wanted to write to you about the common salvation. Verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... It was, more, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was watch, once delivered unto the saints. And if it was important for Jude to exhort his listeners to contend for the faith then, how much more important is it for us to contend for the faith now? Now when he says contend for the faith, he's not saying be contentious. When he says contend for the faith, he's not talking about something that is vague. He is talking about contending for the body of doctrine that is found in the Bible. And that's what the faith is in reference to. He says, I wanted to write to you about the old, old story. I wanted to write to you about the, 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 the great salvation that we have. But he said, it was more needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. And then from verse 4 on down, he begins to describe and warn about these raging waves of the sea. Wandering stars, he calls them. He, he speaks in verse number 4 and speaks about them as certain men who have crept in unawares. They're before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Would you look right this way? I want to give a warning right now. A current, right now, present day warning. You need to be very wary when you hear someone talk about grace. And you need to discern what they're saying. And you need to compare what they're saying to the word of God. You can't have discernment, let me say this, without knowing the real thing and without knowing the word of God. So, so just if you're going to watch TV preachers and you're going to read books and, and, and God's people are going to do that. And you're going to listen to podcasts and read blogs and watch vlogs and watch videos about these things on the Internet. And you're not going to read your Bible. Well, prepare to be duped. If you're not going to read your Bible, you will not have the discernment to know the difference between right and wrong. And there's a lot of crazy extremes about grace. Uh, one extreme says that, that, it, it, that it's a hyper grace movement out of Texas and some guy out there wants to make the grace of God something less than it is. Others want to turn the grace of God into something different than it is. But the Bible teaches that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live so really righteously and godly in this present world. And we're to look for that blessed hope. That's what the grace of God does. The grace of God is not licensed to do whatever I want to do. It brings a limitation upon me by nature of what God's grace is. God, somebody says, well, shall uh, well, we can just sin a bunch because we, we have the grace of God. Paul answered that. He said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So beware when you hear people talk about God's grace. God's grace brings salvation. The grace of God in the Old Testament saved the Old Testament sinner, just like the grace of God in the New Testament saves the New Testament sinner. And so praise God for grace and thank God for it. But it doesn't just save me from hell. It sanctifies me and grows me and develops me. But false teachers, one of the first marks of a false teacher is they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. In the other words, they turn it into something that it is not, something that is a license to do whatever you want, live however you want, and it doesn't really matter. And anybody that says otherwise is a legalist. Beware of a teacher like that. Beware of a teacher like that. Jude, he says in verse number five, I will therefore put you up, uh, put you uh, in remembrance by though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed them that believed not. So after he warns of those that turn the grace of God into lasciviousness in verse four, in verse number five and six and seven, he describes specific judgments that God brought on Egypt, on the angels that sinned and upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says the same judgment that God brought on Egypt, on the angels that sinned, and upon Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to bring against false teachers. Yep. Verse number six, he says he describes them as filthy dreamers who defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Another characteristic of false teachers is they, they produce false converts, and they produce false fruit. 
And, and these false teachers come along and they despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Whenever you hear a preacher speak about the supernatural world and the demonic host as if he has the devil on a chain and God in like a genie in a bottle, he can just pull out, rub the bottle and get whatever he wants. You beware of someone like that. Because they're despising dominion. They're speaking evil of dignities. In verse number 9, it says, Michael the archangel, when contending with the uh, bod devil over the body, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Uh, I, I heard a preacher years ago down in North Carolina say to a group of young people, there were probably 400 young people there, he said, the devil's not that powerful. He said, no, he said, the devil knows how to lie, and he knows how to lie real good, but he's not that powerful. I thought that preacher has just done a disservice to every one of these young people in this place. The devil is a formidable foe. If he weren't that powerful, then nobody would be buying into his lie. If he weren't that powerful, he wouldn't be keeping people in chains. What a foolish notion and what a disrespectful way to talk about your adversary. If you speak disrespectful about your adversary, he's already got you. Verse number nine, verse 10, it says, these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts and those things, they defile themselves. Are you listening carefully? I don't care if it's an independent Baptist preacher or anybody else. A preacher that's involved in immorality and, 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 and acting like a barnyard animal is, is a false teacher. Something's wrong. Something's bad wrong with his integrity, bad wrong with his character, and bad wrong with his teaching. And so what, what are their characteristics? Well, they're going to experience God's judgment. They make the grace of God what it is not. They despise things uh, of the supernatural. They commit immorality. Verse 11, he brings judgment. Look at verse 11. Woe unto them. He describes them as gone in the way of Cain. That's a bloodless way. They've ran greedily after the heir of Balaam. That's a greedy way. And they caught up and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. That is a disrespectful towards authority way. In verse 12, it says, these are spots in your feast of charity. It describes them as clouds without water, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by the roots. He describes them as raging waves of the sea in verse 13, wandering stars. Here today, a bright something that everybody can look at and wow at and gone tomorrow. He describes the preaching of Enoch as an antidote to this, and he describes a holy God that brings judgment in verse 15. Verse 16, he describes them as murmurers and complainers, and they walk after their own lust, and they're full of pride, with their mouth speaking great swelling words of vanity, having men's persons and admiration because of admiration because of advantage. That, you know what that is? A politician preacher. That's somebody that's always trying to get ahead, climb the, the clerical ladder, trying to get ahead, trying to be at the top. No, no, beware of someone like that and beware of a Christian like that. He says, verse 17, beloved, remember ye the words which are spoken before of the Lord, of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly less. Watch verse 19, what they do. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. You, 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 you did what? The first point tonight that I want to gather is you, you received not the spirit. Speaking about them, he says, these are those who separate themselves. That means they separate themselves from everything that's good and right and holy and decent and true. Having not the spirit. That means they've never been saved. They've never been born again. They've never accepted God's gift of eternal life. You say, wait a second, preachers can do that? Yes. You, you mean people that follow after some of these preachers can do that? Yes. Jesus said in Matthew 7, many shall come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me. I never knew you, ye workers of iniquity. So apparently their wonderful works weren't so good after all. Apparently their wonderful works weren't measured by God's holy standard. Apparently their wonderful works weren't submitted first and foremost to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and through the resurrection. What? You, you, you did what? You, you rejected the spirit of God? You received the, not the spirit of God? You, you rejected his spirit? Now his spirit right now is moving all across this world and around the nation, wooing men, drawing men, pulling men, pointing men to the Lord Jesus Christ and to salvation. That's what is happening all around the world right now. You can count on it. You can bank on it. God's Holy Spirit 
is working. He's working in your life, just like I said last night. God is working. He's working now. He's working here. He's working mightily, and he wants to work through me. Listen to me. God's Spirit is working. I was talking to a friend of mine in, in Wyoming some years ago. He'd, he'd played quarterback for the University of Wyoming down in, in, in Laramie. And, and uh, he, he, was, he was there, now retired. And we were talking about the Lord. He was asking me some questions about Calvinism. And I absolutely reject all five points of Calvinism. I think it's a heresy from hell. And I, I think that Calvin was a, a heretic. So it, uh, ask me later and I'll tell you what I really think. But anyway, uh, uh, he, 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 he and I were talking and I, and I said, no, God, God is not a part of some theology that says I select you and you and you, but all the rest of you, sorry, I don't select you to go to heaven. What an abomination. And as we were talking, right on the Fox News came a man who was blind. He was blinded in battle. And he came, he came back from Iraq or Afghanistan, I can't remember which. And he so wanted to serve his country that after his wounds were healed... He went and taught at West Point, and he wrote a book, Hope Unseen, or something like that. And it was really a, a neat book, and this guy gave clear testimony on Fox News to the salvation that's found only in Jesus Christ, and it was a blessing. And I said, think of that. I said, God doesn't select this person, and then two houses down another person, and then four houses down another person. He has just shown millions of people on Fox News how to be saved. Why? Because he's constantly working, drawing. He uses creation. He uses our conscience. He uses the love of God. He, he uses Christ himself to draw men and women to himself. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing. And if you're here right now, he's doing that with you. If you're not saved, he's drawing you, wooing you, bringing you to himself. The Bible says that he'll reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment to come. Of sin because they believe not on me. And righteousness because I go to my Father. And ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So right now, all across the, in this area of LaGrange and up into Sturgis and over to Angola and all the way over to Goshen and South Bend and, and even Chicago. I know it's hard to believe, but even Chicago, God's Holy Spirit is drawing people to himself. And he's drawing all kinds of different people. And he's drawing them with his love. And he's drawing them with his kindness. And they have a choice. Every day they live, they have a choice. Somebody asked me, what do you think about Calvinism? I said, well, I, uh, I'll tell you what I think about Calvinism. I believe that God has voted for you. He wants you to be saved. He hates sin. He sent his son Jesus to take the debt of sin upon his shoulders and to die in your place and mine. God has voted for you. He's for you. The devil has voted against you. He hates you. He wants you to burn in hell just like he is going to. He wants you to writhe and scream in torment. He doesn't want you to have an abundant life and he certainly doesn't want you to have eternal life. You cast the deciding vote. There you go. It's no more complicated than that. There's two groups of people in the world. People who have accepted the Spirit, who have received the Spirit, who have ex responded to the Spirit of God and to the grace of God. They've accepted God's gift and those who haven't. Now, which are you? If tonight you're one who has not accepted God's gift of eternal life and you've not by faith trusted in him, then he wants to save you and he wants to save you tonight. Don't be like the false teachers. The false teachers are lying. The false teachers are liars. At best, they're deceivers and at, at best, they're deceived and at worst, they're deceivers. They're not for you. They're against you. Don't be like them. They're going to experience judgment. Don't be like them. They're spots and wandering stars and clouds without water and trees without fruit. They're going to experience the judgment of God. Don't be like them. Don't be someone who has not the Spirit. Turn to Romans chapter 8. I want to show it to you there. Romans chapter 8 in the Word of God. I want you to see this about the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8, it says, now, let me just pause and say something about Romans 8. When the Bible in Romans 8 speaks about those in the flesh, he's not talking about somebody that's lost their temper. He's not talking about somebody that's acting in the flesh or committing or displaying a work of the flesh. He's not talking about that. That's unlike Galatians chapter 5. When he speaks about those that are in the flesh in Romans chapter 8, he's talking about somebody that is not saved. That's a very important truth to understand. And look at Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. 
For the law of the Spirit of Christ, life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. All right, remember I said there's two groups of people in the world. Aren't you glad that God makes it simple? How many of you like simple? Let me see your hand. You like simple? I like simple. Oh, man, give me simple. When I pull out instructions on how to put some toy together or some, some thing together that my wife just found at Ikea, ay, ay, ay. Anyway, she finds something and I got to put it together. Man, I like pictures. I'm just going to tell you right up. I'm going to go shallow and I'm going to go simple. I like pictures. And I don't want to see all the different nuances and I don't want to hear all the different details. I just want pictures to put it together. When I go to a restaurant, I like pictures. Thank you very much on a menu. If it's got a bunch of words, then I just say, I'll have what he had or I'll have what she had. I don't like, I just like simple. I like to keep it simple. God keeps it simple. There's two types of people in the world. Those who've accepted God's gift of eternal life, they're in Christ, they're saved, they're considered righteous, and those who have not accepted God's gift of eternal life, they're in the flesh. Look at verse 3, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, that's the fleshly mind, that's the, the, the mind without Christ, the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Verse 8 is powerful. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Again, I cannot underscore the importance of comparing Scripture with Scripture and understanding context. In Romans 8, those that are in the flesh are not those displaying the works of the flesh. They are those who have never been saved. They're in the flesh. In verse number 9, he says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So watch. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Do you see it now? You, 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 you did what? The Holy Spirit's been wooing you? He's been pleading with you? He's been drawing you? He's been pointing you to Christ? He's been pointing you to the message of the cross? And you did what? You rejected his message? You rejected his plea? I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit's a much better preacher than me. He didn't even preach as long as I do. <laughs> I mean, he comes right to the point of the matter. And he deals with you right where you're at. He knows everything about you. And he's wooing and drawing. And he's not putting on you false guilt like the devil does. He's putting true conviction. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't work like men works. He, and he doesn't work like the devil works. The devil uses the currency of doubt and unbelief. And he sells it and pawns it off. Like it's some kind of valuable currency that you should actually consider. The Holy Spirit doesn't deal that way. The Holy Spirit deals in conviction. If you're lost right now, the Holy Spirit's saying, you're lost and you need to be saved. You're one in that second category, someone who's not received the gift of God. You're one in that second category, somebody who is, not, uh, who is in the flesh, not in the spirit. You need to be saved. Listen to this raving maniac on the platform. Listen to the little blonde-headed midget. He's right. You need to be saved. That's what the Holy Spirit's saying right now. And the sooner the better. And the truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, is this, that if you need to be saved, it would be perfectly appropriate in this setting to raise your hand right now and right in the middle of the whole service and say, I need to be saved. And we'd stop everything and help you to Jesus. It's that important. It's that important. I was preaching along these lines in Hendersonville, North Carolina, some years ago. And I, I made a comment or a statement like that. I said, if you need to be saved, you can be saved right now. And if you need to be saved, just stand up and raise your hand and say, I need to be saved. And five minutes later, a lady over here on my right, sitting right about where the pastor's daughters are, stood up and she raised her hand. I said, oh, no, what has happened? This lady's going to start speaking in tongues. And what are we going to do? What am I going to do? And I looked at her and I kind of paused. And then I, I saw tears streaming down her face. And, and I was like, the Lord said, hey, you dummy, you just said this five minutes ago. Give her a chance to get saved. I said, do you need to be saved? She said, yes. And the pastor's wife took her out right then and asked her and showed her how to be saved. You know what happened? You know what happened? Five minutes before when I had said that, the friend that brought her to church prayed. And she said, Lord... My heart's been cold and backslidden and away from you. She said, I know my friend needs to be saved. She said, if she gets saved and raises her hand in the next few minutes, 
and get saved, I'll come back to you. So two birds with one stone, how about that? The Lord, the Lord got that lady saved that brought, was, was a guest, and, and that one that brought her was, we got, got right with God. Praise God for that. I mean, it's that important. Are you kidding me? We're not Presbyterian or Catholics around here. We don't have to go through rote tradition and rote formality, and we gotta do this and stand up and sit down, and once this is done, we, we gotta finish this out. We, we'll take any kind of interruption like that. Now, I want to say that what, you did what to the Holy Spirit? And how long has he been wooing you? And how long has he been pleading with you? And how long has he been whispering, get saved right now. And you don't need to be in church to get saved. And you don't need to be around a preacher to get saved. You can get saved right now. And you've done what? You've said no? Oh, I want to tell you. The Bible makes it very clear in the book of Matthew chapter 12 that if you go too far, you can say no to the Holy Spirit one time too many. And when you do, you cross a line from which there's no return and you reject the Holy Spirit and blaspheme the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, oh, that's a dangerous place to be. Don't do that. Don't do that. You, you, you did what to the Holy Spirit? You, you received not the Holy Spirit? Don't do that to the Holy Spirit. I want you to take your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 63, would you? Isaiah chapter 63. You, you, you did what? I can still see my son. <laughs> he's up there. He's got two, two, two holes in his hand where the snake bit him. I said, you did what? Well, what, are you, what are you doing picking up snakes? I, I, what in the world? I can't believe Peter is my, my, my uh, he's, he's on a first name basis with those in the ER. You know what I mean? I mean, when he was just a little bit baby, he fell out of the truck, got a concussion. And, and then he got bit. This is the first time he got bit by a snake. Then he got bit by a snake again. And he's just, you know, he knows he put his foot right, put a nail, rusty nail right through his foot, foot, all kinds of problems. I could keep you here all night telling you about Peter and all the things that have happened to him. But I still can see him now. I said, you did what? And then I kind of caught myself. I said, wait, I need to show a little compassion at this particular juncture in the situation here. But I want to ask you, you did what? You did what to the Holy Spirit? You have not received the Spirit? Well, this is a serious one. Look at Isaiah chapter 63, verse 1. Who is he, this, that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to be mighty to save. That's a, this is a reference to our great Savior, the Lord Jesus. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Mm. That doesn't sound like a sweet baby in a manger, does it? That sound, doesn't sound like a dead Christ on the cross, does it? No. For the day of my vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury. I will bring down their strength to the earth. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord, and the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies, and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. This is talking about a loving savior to his people, Israel. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all, by, uh, carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. You, you, you did what to the Holy Spirit? Those false prophets in Jude, they have not received the Spirit. This crowd in Israel, speaking of Israel, though he loved them, though he carried them, though he walked with them, and though the scripture says he showed pity upon them, they rebelled. And vexed his Holy Spirit. Vex means to grate against. Vex means to go in the opposite direction of. Vexed has the idea of fighting against. Vex not the Spirit. There, there are those that have not received the Spirit. They've rejected the Spirit. But then there are those who have vexed his Holy Spirit. 
when His Holy Spirit is drawing us, the Bible says in John 14 and John 16 that He'll guide us into all truth. The Bible says that He won't speak of Himself, but He'll speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, He surely describes, because He's the author of the Bible, Himself and in a lot of other theological aspects about God. But He's speaking about the, the, the Holy Spirit. He's pointing people to the truth. He's pointing people away from evil. He is the Holy Spirit. And, and, and you did what to him? You went in the opposite direction of the Holy Spirit? You vexed him? You grated against his will and his wishes and his desires? You, you did what? Oh, how many times the Holy Spirit is vexed. And did you notice the word that he used in describing vexing? It says they rebelled. They rebelled against his word. They rebelled against his precepts. They rebelled against his commands. They rebelled against his statutes. They said, God, when you say yes, we're saying no. When you say no, we're saying yes. Whew. Now, you know what being a parent has taught me? How patient God the Father has been with me. Sometimes... I see my children doing wrong or throughout the years I've, I've tried to, to direct them and discipline them and point them towards the right. And at different ages, there are different stages of discipline and training and instruction and direction. When I've seen them do wrong, sometimes the Holy Spirit says, now you know how I must feel when you directly disobey me. Now, now the goal is to be obeying the Lord more than we're disobeying Him. The goal is to be living for Him. You know, He's the one that's in the driver's seat when you get saved. There's only one room, there's only one, there's only room for one in that driver's seat. Not two. Even if it's a bench seat. Now we got a bench seat. But that bench seat only has one driver's seat. And the Lord's the only one that can drive your life. How miserable it must be when he's the driver and we're trying to grab the wheel. When we're trying to direct him on how it should be. Right? Some of you know what I'm talking about because you have backseat drivers or front seat drivers. I got at least one amen on that. It was the pastor. I, now, I'm just saying, I'm not trying to stir up strife. I'm not trying to stir up strife, Miss Heidi. <laughs> yeah, but we know what that is. Now, watch here, don't we? We know what it is, how miserable when we're driving. Somebody's trying to tell us what to do. Somebody's trying to tell us how to drive. Wow, we know what that is. How miserable it must be when the Lord is trying to direct our paths to the shady green pastures and a, through the valley of the shadow of death and, and away from evil and protecting us and guiding us as the good shepherd would. And we're trying to tell him how to drive. What a way to vex him. To rebel against him. To tell him the rules instead of follow his rules. To grate against his will and his word and his plan. You did what to the Holy Spirit? You didn't receive him though he's been wooing you and drawing you to himself. So that he can rescue you from hell. And he can give you eternal life and abundant life. You did what to the Holy Spirit? You rejected his wooing? You did what to the Holy Spirit? You vexed him. You've rebelled against him. You've graded against him. You've gone the opposite way of him. Wow. Take your Bible and turn with me right now to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. It says in verse number 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. So we can... Reject the Holy Spirit or be like those false prophets who have not the Spirit. We can vex the Holy Spirit instead of following God's Word and not vexing the Holy Spirit. And we can grieve the Holy Spirit. The idea of grieve has the idea of, of wounding. The idea of grieve has the idea of, uh, of disregarding. And if you want to know exactly what grieve means, look at the context of Ephesians 4. Look at what it says, Ephesians chapter 4. And it says in verse number 25, go back to verse number 22. 
21, it says, If so be ye have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, that's your life before you were saved, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth unto his neighbor. For we are members one of another. So what grieves the Holy Spirit? When I don't put off the old man and when I don't put on the new man. When I'm not renewed in the spirit of my mind. That grieves him. Verse number 25. Wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth to his neighbor. When I lie, that grieves him. Verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What grieves him? When I let the sun go down upon my wrath. When I, when I go to sleep and there are unresolved conflicts. When I go to prayer and there are unresolved conflicts. Are there unresolved conflicts in your life? In Matthew 5, Jesus said, If you bring your gift to the altar and rem there rememberest that thou hast ought against thy brother, that you have ought against your brother, leave your gift at the altar, go make it right with your brother, then come and offer your gift. In other words, when you go to sleep and there are unresolved conflict, and you go to prayer and there are unresolved conflict, conflicts, that grieves the Lord. Now you say, preacher, what if I've gone to that person and tried to make it right? Well, then you put the ball in their court. But if you haven't gone to them and make it, made it right, then you have a problem. In Matthew 18, he says, if a brother has offended you, you go and make it right. So you know what the ideal situation is? The guy that's praying realizes he has ought or has offended his brother. And the guy that is, is in Matthew 18, he realizes that, that his brother has offended him. And they, they stop everything they're doing and they go to make it right and they meet in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord doesn't let any of us off the hook. The person that's committed the offense and the person that has been offended, both are to seek to make it right. In other words, I should seek to be making it right with my fellow man. If you're not making it right that with your fellow man, you're not right with God. Sing like a canary all you want to. Uh, sing like a songbird. Uh, sing like a nightingale. Sing like a cardinal. I don't care what you sing like. If you're not right with man, you're not right with God. So get right with man. Seek to make it right with your spouse. Seek to make it right with your siblings. Seek to make it right with your parents. Seek to make it right with your kids. Seek to make it right with your brother and sister in Christ. If you don't, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. Verse 27, neither give place to the devil. When you give place to the devil, you give him an inch, you give him a little leeway, you give him a little foot in the door. That grieves the Holy Spirit. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. Stealing grieves the Holy Spirit. But rather let him labor, working with his hand the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying. Corrupt communication grieves the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> Wounds him. Bludgeons him. Grieves him. Verse number 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, Evil speaking, be put away with, from you with all malice. What grieves the Holy Spirit? Everything that's listed in verse 31. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. We live in a world that's clamorous. Yeah. I, I, when I was growing up in high school, we were taught to debate, proper debate, civil debate. Yeah. That means arguing your case. I, I don't think it's always wrong for siblings to argue. Sometimes my kids argue and I just let them go at it. And I listen to see how they're arguing. And if there's any sanity or reason or logic or good points brought up in their arguments. I think it's good for siblings to argue. And I don't think it's good for them to fight. I mean, most of the time. Guys are a little bit different than girls. Guys need to fight, kind of just get it done with, you know, and then move on with life. Uh, but but you, you understand what I'm saying here. Uh, we were taught that you, you argue. We, I went to a Christian school and they, we weren't all of the same stripe. Sometimes we had different church backgrounds. And we'd argue. We'd have really just, just plain, honest, intense, ferocious, passionate debates. And then you know what we'd do? We'd go out in the snow in the middle of winter and play football. And we were still friends. This world seems to have no knowledge of that. I don't care what side of what argument or debate you're on. This side yells at this side, and this side yells a little louder at this side, and this side yells a little louder, and then the next thing you know, it's fisticuff, and nothing has accomplished, been accomplished at all. That's clamor. That's right. That does not please the Lord. Wow. That grieves him? Mm-hmm. Wounds him. 
bludgeons him. Grieves his heart. He says, grieve not the Spirit of God. You did what to the Spirit? You rejected him? When all he's trying to do is rescue you from hell and give you a life worth living now? You did what to the Spirit? You vexed him, grated against him, went the opposite direction of him, rebelled against him? You did what to the Spirit? You grieved him? Whew. How? How he even works with us again is amazing. Look at one final passage, 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. Notice what the text says, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19. As characteristic of Paul, he often ends his epistle with several small commands. Powerful commands. Commands you could write books on, each one of. And look at what he says in verse number 19. Quench not the Spirit. Well, this is the fourth one we'll examine and find. You, 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 you did what to the Spirit? You've rejected Him when all He's trying to do is save your soul from hell? Give you a life worth living and give you eternal life after? You, you did what to the Holy Spirit? You vexed Him and rebelled against Him and grated against Him and went the opposite direction of Him? So that He had to become your enemy? You did what to the Holy Spirit? You grieved Him by evil speaking and bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and, and, and all of that? And now, He says, quench not the Spirit. These are four characteristics that we can display against the Holy Spirit, and when we do, it's counterproductive in our own lives. Or, we can do the opposite. Vex not the Holy Spirit, grieve not the Holy Spirit, quench not the Spirit. What does it mean to quench the Spirit? Well, the best way to know what a verse means is look at the context. Look at the context. Uh, verse number 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. So what quenches him? When we render evil for evil, instead of overcoming evil with good. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. What quenches him? When we don't rejoice. When we complain and gripe and bellyache and murmur. Pray without ceasing. What quenches the Holy Spirit? When we, when we fail in our prayer life. Quenches him. What quenches the Holy Spirit? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When we're ungrateful. Verse 20, despise not prophesying. Do you know what that means? Don't despise preaching. Boy, we ought to love preaching. I got a text from a friend of mine today, and he says, I just got to have preaching. The teaching's good. Teaching has its place. But I need preaching. I need someone that's going to inspire me. Sometimes stomp on my toes. Put the balm of Gilead in. I need preaching. And, and, and I don't want to despise it. Now, I want to tell you, not all preaching is the same. And please, whatever you do, don't compare my preaching with your pastor. That's an unfair comparison. You know why? Because I can preach the same sermons over and over. Now, I don't. I have a whole lot more sermons. Some people say that we evangelists only have seven sermons, and that is not true. We have eight. Ha. Anyway, uh, uh, I just want to say, don't compare your, your pastor with, with me. He has to prepare three, sometimes four new sermons a week. So don't, don't compare the evangelist or anybody else with your pastor. Not all preaching is the same. But if it's Bible preaching, that means they open the Bible and they read from the Bible and they make application from the Bible. Even if it's boring and he reads from a manuscript in a monotone voice, or if he stands on his head and gargles peanut butter while he quotes the 23rd Psalm, if it's Bible preaching, you ought to walk out and say, thank God for that. God spoke to my heart for that. One of the greatest problems I have with the home church movement that has swept across this country is the diminishing of Bible preaching. There's no Bible preaching going on. There might be a Bible study, which is, has its place, but it shouldn't take the place of Bible preaching. It shouldn't take the place of the pulpit. It shouldn't take the place of the sacred desk. It shouldn't take the place of the leather lung, Spirit of God, Spirit of God filled preacher. It shouldn't take the place of a preacher that's going to point his finger and pound the pulpit and say, Thus saith the Lord. It should not take the place of that. Oh, how I need preaching. And when, when, when the preacher gives an invitation, respond. Oh, don't, don't, 
don't, don't tell me about your Christianity and how wonderful it is if the pastor has given an invitation three times a week and you haven't come forward in two years. Don't tell me about your Christianity. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. And you know, I believe, Pastor, that's one reason why some pastors just give up on the invitation. Because week after week and week, month after month, they give an invitation. Nobody moves. Can't move me. I'm a Baptist. I shall not be moved. And they're not going to be moved. They're not going to be responding. Are you kidding me? Are, are, you, are you really kidding me? I, I mean, I heard a guy training preachers years ago, and he said, the more you grow in Christ, the less you need to go forward. Now, there's a Hebrew word for that. Baloney. You know what I've found in my Christian life? The more I grow in Christ, the more I need to go forward. The more I need to respond. Sometimes when I get off the road and I'm listening to preaching for a little while, I'm saying, I wish the preacher would shut up so that I get to the front and get right with God. You see? But when I despise prophesying and preaching, I quench the spirit. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. When I don't show discernment, I quench the spirit. Abstain from all appearance of evil. When I'm okay with evil and I'm okay with the appearance of evil, I'm quenching the spirit. Right. Now, I found with a the fire, there's two ways to quench it. You can quench it by ignoring it, walking away from it, and just letting it burn out. Or you can get a bucket of water or a hose and throw it on that fire. I wonder when you look at your life, if you see... The Holy Spirit says, don't go there. Don't say that. Don't get any further more passionate in your, in your anger. Don't, don't gossip. Don't talk about this person. And we say, psh, psh, and we quench him. And you know, a nice fire is really a blessing. Is it not? Amen. Especially on a cold spring night like it's now. But how does that fire work when it's nothing but a bunch of smoldering wet wood and smoke? Or somebody's quenched it. And all you do is inhale the smoke. And pretty soon it's... <coughs> I wonder if that's the response that people get from being around Dwight Smith. Or if this is the response. Oh, it's so warm. Oh, there's light here. Oh, that's a blessing. You did what? Yeah. The Holy Spirit? Would you bow with me in prayer? <laughs> Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'd like Brother Drew to come and sing and I'd like Miss Heidi to come and play. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. The altar's open right now. I want to ask one question. Are you here? And you said, preacher... I'm, I'm in need of salvation. I've never been saved and I just need to be saved. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up tonight and say, Preacher, I've not received the Holy Spirit. I've not accepted Christ as my Savior and I need to and I want to. Is there anyone here like that? Preacher, pray for me. I don't have the Spirit. I don't have salvation. All right, the altar's open. Let's stand to our feet, shall we? As she plays and Brother Drew sings, would you mind the Lord? Would you join him? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me.
Pastor. Thank you for being here tonight. You are the strength. The Lord is 